Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society. We hear now from Professor Maggie Andrews about women and the family. My name is Maggie Andrews. I'm Professor of Cultural History at the University of Worcester. The whole of my career really has been exploring domestic life of women in the 20th century. When most people think about women in the First World War, they think about a nurse, about someone working in munitions factories. Maybe they think about a land girl. But the majority of women were housewives. They were doing mundane things, and particularly if they had children, they went on having to do ordinary things, but under very different circumstances and with things being much more challenging. One needs to think about the home and the family as quite a finely tuned unit. Working class households, in order to survive, they had all sorts of different ways in which they earned money, all sorts of different ways in which they saved and spent that money. For example, if they were in the black country area, they would definitely, even in an urban area, have a pig in the backyard because that pig was going to provide the meat for the year. They might have chickens, they might have fruit and vegetables, the women might do outwork, maybe glove making if they were in the Worcestershire area, they might take in washing. A man's salary in terms of the father and in many households, the children's wages were very important because most children are leaving school at the age of 12 and 13. All those contributed to the household surviving. Then war comes along and slowly but steadily, you get all sorts of new challenges. So you get men joining up. That might be sons. That might be fathers. Theoretically, the government supports them. They provide separation allowances. They provide widow's allowances if your husband dies. However, in practice, it's quite different. There are huge delays in the payment of separation allowances. For instance, if you are, as a lot of people were at this time, living a little bit hand to mouth, a bit behind with the rent, then your husband joins up and you wait six weeks for your separation allowance, you probably lost your house because you've been turfed out by the landlord. Maybe your husband was earning not particularly well, but you had two young sons who were earning well. Suddenly, all three of them are earning less well in the forces. Again, you could find yourself in a much worse position. We have stories of women who have a son who's died, husband who's in the forces, and their income has gone down by two thirds. Mundane housewifery becomes really hard work in the war. There are price rises, increasing food shortages as the war continues. And by 1917, there are food queues which could take six hours to obtain a tub of margarine. We have lots of reports of that with hundreds of people waiting in the queues. Women play savvy on this. They put the children in the food queue for them while they go off and do something else. The way in which a household operates has to rework itself. Children have to do roles that were once parents' roles or elder brothers' roles. Women have to expand what they do to grow vegetables, which once the husband did. One of the letters we have is this husband writing home because he's concerned that his pregnant wife is going to have to salt the family pig when it's killed before Christmas. Pigs are quite large, heavy animals, and the idea of her doing it pregnant alone, he's terribly concerned about. Women's domestic roles also expand when men are away because they're doing the domestic caring for them at a distance sending them parcels, buying things for them. There's a lovely story in Sylvia Pankhurst's home front book she wrote in the 1930s about the woman who gets herself in debt because she feels when her husband goes off to the army, she must send him off with new underwear. This is not in her budget. And then she's dealing with the debt afterwards. They're sending things like cakes, cherries, or they're sending them a Christmas pudding that they've made. And they're getting letters back from husbands and from sons asking them to give them news, but also send things. So we have a story of... A young lad of 17 who sends back to his mother a letter asking to be sent a handkerchief because he's got a cold and he can't manage to get out to get a handkerchief. For many, the home involved maybe a small holding, a business, and they will also have had to take that on. We have women, for instance, who have got to take on the husband's role running the grocer's business or running the pub or running the small holding. 
Occasionally, they're allowed to do it in terms of farms. It's quite difficult for them to take over the farms, and usually men are able to be allowed not to go. You find all these reworkings of what women do and men do. Prior to the First World War, women did a lot of tasks to help with businesses. They helped run the farm. What is important in the First World War is that suddenly this becomes more visible. You get newspapers saying, isn't it wonderful? Without the country housewife, all the fruit would be rotting on the trees and go to waste. The allotments would not be operating. But it's only conditional until the men come home. And in most respects, it goes back to normal. For instance, we have a woman who runs a small holding with her husband in Pershaw. She's got four young children. He goes off to war. And because fruit and vegetables are so important, they allow him to come back from war to help with the harvest. So in the middle of 1916, the Battle of the Somme, he comes back from France, helps bring in the harvest, then goes back to France again. Unfortunately, he's dead before the end of the year. And then she goes on with her four young children running that small holding for the next 10 to 20 years. So there are some where there's a real change. As time goes on, the challenges of ordinary feeding of the family become really, really difficult. When we started the war, we imported most of our sugar, most of our wheat. We were a country which relied upon bread. That's what the working class has consumed. Bread is made from wheat. Slowly but steadily, women are encouraged, with prices going up, to change what they eat. They're actually told to persuade their family to chew much longer, because if they chew longer, they won't want to eat so much. This was a little extreme. They are constantly encouraged to preserve, to not waste anything, use less sugar, less fats, less meat. And what happens is that huge numbers of recipes emerge, which are such hard work. I cannot describe to you, having tried them out, the level of chopping and cutting, pureeing that are required to make something out of nothing, where people don't have the same technology as we have now. We did one study where we had recipes for Christmas puddings across the different periods of the war. By the end of it, it's almost like a vegetable soup. It's grim. We got one group of women to try out making eggless sponge cakes. You were supposed to donate your eggs to the wounded soldiers. And eggs became very expensive anyway, so you make your cake without eggs. It requires quite a lot of beating. When people came in, having tried it out, one said, well, of course, I use an electric mixer, but I couldn't do that with my arthritic hands. So how do people who are physically not as fit as they might be cope with the really hard work that domesticity begins to entail? The home and the family is ideologically really important. It's what people are fighting for, after all. The government is pouring money into supporting homes. It's paying separation allowances, widows' benefits. And as a result it begins to have a view about how those homes are run. It begins to feel it has more of a right to check they're being run appropriately. There's an enormous amount of concern about what women are doing with separation allowances, with the money that's coming into their hands every week to keep the home going. There's a lot of concern about them being lazy, about them drinking, about whether they are keeping their children properly and clean more and more people begin to take a role in surveying and governing what goes on in the household. There is a rise of the infant welfare movement of cases taken against women for being drunk or for abandoning their children or for neglecting their children. We have a case, for instance, in Pershaw in Worcestershire. This poor woman with five children, husband's been injured, she's living on very modest means on her separation allowance, and two of the children get scabies. In comes a health visitor and says, the children are not as clean as they should be. The house is not quite as clean as it should be. You should be washing your blankets more frequently. The poor woman points out that she spent money buying patent medicines and tried to cure her children, that she can't clean the blankets because there's nowhere in terms of laundries within six or seven miles. But still she's fine 10 shillings and the magistrate tells her quite emphatically that she should learn to keep her house cleaner in future. That's quite a level of public interference and surveillance of the private world of the home. The concern about infant mortality and children's welfare is at one level a response to the appalling infant mortality there is. In 1915 it's more dangerous to be a child in the slums of London than it is to be on the Western Front. And that's very linked to poverty. But infant welfare is something 
which women of all sorts of different political persuasions can get behind. Quite imperialist suffrage campaigners like Millicent Fawcett, who led the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, support infant welfare. This is the most important job women can do, she says. Women who are quite communist and pacifist in their leaning, like Sylvia Pankhurst. Women who have opposed the suffrage, and there were really quite a lot of them. This is something that women can come together around. Unfortunately, that's very often seen as a middle-class women's issue to tell working-class women what to do, which many working-class women resist. A woman in Scotland was beside herself with anger about it, and she writes to the paper saying, this has got to be stopped. How dare these middle-class women start visiting us in our homes and insisting that we go to antenatal classes. Scottish women will not be treated like this. She quotes some poor women in Stoke-on-Trent who are being visited within three days of the baby being born by some middle-class busybody trying to tell them what to do and how to bring up their child with no experience at all of bringing up a child in the poverty in which they're living. There's quite an interesting coming together of the groups that have been both for and anti-suffrage. In 1918, of course, women, for the first time, are going to have the parliamentary vote. They have for several years had the right to vote in local elections. It's only women over 30 who reach certain property qualifications who actually get the right to vote. And yet the one thing that's brought them together is a concern about maternity, infant welfare, and very traditional female issues. So that in the post-war world, rather than some great liberation of women, what we get is, in many respects, the heyday of domesticity. A real focus on the home and the family, and many women's organisations saying that they want one job, not two. They want to work in the home and not to be forced to work outside it as well. Although so many people see this period as a period of liberation and the mobility of women and the freedom of women in political terms. When you actually look at what's going on, by the mid-1920s, there are no more women working than there were prior to the war. There's a real focus on domesticity and the politics that women are concerned with are the local and maternal politics, which actually they could have done before the war. That was Professor Maggie Andrews on Women and the Family. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Rosie Kennedy about children's experience of the First World War.